when a woman's own desires trump the needs of children, a tale of horror can unfold. A mother of two wants another child at any cost. One of the worst, if not the worst, crimes I've ever seen. A grandmother's devotion masks her sadistic nature. His existence would be horrendous. And a brutal act of revenge devastates a family. She knew it would hurt their father to his very core. These deadly women prey on the young and vulnerable. They kill without pity. Beaverton, Oregon, 2007. A young couple suffers a heartbreaking tragedy. It'll be all right. The loss of their unborn child. Karina Roberts already has two children from previous relationships. But the 26-year-old wants a child with her current man. Karina's relationship with her boyfriend had been going on for about five years at that time. She had two children with different people, a daughter who was 10 and a son who was six. Her boyfriend didn't have any children, and they had talked about wanting to have children. She fears without a baby, she may lose her relationship. Her boyfriend is a loving man to her children. But Karina knows he wants a baby of his own. She wanted a baby, and I think she wanted it to bond with the man she was living with. In November 2008, Karina is blessed with not one tiny miracle, but two. Twins. You're joking. <laughs> And from that time on, all throughout the next six months, she had started gathering baby items, such as clothing, uh, outfits. An excited Karina takes her news to the streets. What are you up to? <laughs> uh, I'm pregnant. That's wonderful. Karina's self-esteem was pretty much completely tied to being a mother, specifically to being pregnant. In the nearby city of Portland, the joy of a new baby is filling Heather Snively's life too. She and her fiance have just moved to the area to start a new life. Heather Snively was a happy 21-year-old expectant mother. Oh. <laughs> Put it on. Okay. Let's see. Okay, okay. She was very excited to be a mom. By all accounts, she was putting a lot of energy and focus into preparing for this birth, setting up the baby's room, just getting everything ready. Oh. <laughs> Not long now, darling. Excited. Everything was about the baby at that point. Both Heather and Karina turn to the internet for their baby shopping. We know that that's how she ended up connecting with Karina. The two of them soon get chatting. They shared some of the same interests. She and Karina became pretty good friends. She's invited me to go shopping with her on Friday. The expectant moms have so much in common, they click in the real world, too. I can't believe how 
I'll take some of that stuff off. It was so good, so good. They met up several times uh, to exchange items. <laughs> good. But one of these two moms has a secret that no one could ever imagine. She had her tubes tied shortly after the birth of her second child. Karina couldn't get pregnant, so she did everything she could to convince her boyfriend that she was, in fact, capable of having a child. She has faked a miscarriage and now a pregnancy. Karina had made up the story about being pregnant in 2007 and then again in 2008. Karina and her boyfriend had a pretty stressed and rocky relationship. She used the lie of pregnancy to hold that relationship together because it was fulfilling something in her relationship that she was attempting to keep together. And her deception works. Karina was a very good actress when it came to playing the part of a pregnant woman. And she had her boyfriend fooled. Until Karina's due date closes in. Karina needs twins. And she needs them now. It's basically time for her to produce. Beaverton, Oregon, 2008. 27-year-old mother of two, Karina Roberts, tells the world she is expecting twins. News her live-in boyfriend has been yearning for. Online, Karina bonds with pregnant women. Oh, this woman says she knows where to get bargains. Including 21-year-old Heather Snively. Karina met with Heather on several occasions. They went out and looked for baby items. June 5th, 2009, Karina arranges another shopping trip with Heather. I'm going shopping today with that woman I met online. I'll see you tonight. Heather's fiance, Chris, gave Heather a hug and a kiss goodbye, told her he loved her and he was excited to see her after work. And then as he was leaving, he turned around came back and gave her another hug and kiss and just said he just felt like he needed to be close to her. Karina invites Heather back to her home. She was able to gain enough confidence and, and get her to come inside the home. Do you mind if I use the bathroom? No, okay. no, it's, uh, it's first on the Heather has no idea what is in store. Karina's phantom pregnancy is about to get real. While they were both inside the residence alone, Karina was able to get a collapsible ass baton and had a metal tip on the end of it. able to somehow attack Heather with that baton um, by striking her in the head. There were multiple blows to Heather's head from the baton. She was struck 15 to 30 times, mostly in the back of the head. Heather tries to save her life and her unborn baby. She had some defensive wounds. She had cuts to her right breast and abdomen. She had bite marks on her right arm. But the heavily pregnant woman is no match for Karina. Heather died trying to save her unborn baby. 
And the evidence of that is all over Karina's house. Now she does the unthinkable. Karina got a razor blade and used the razor blade to cut Heather from hip to hip across her lower abdomen. Heather's baby is 10 weeks premature. The baby was removed from Heather's body, but never took a breath. Karina wanted a live baby, but is left with two dead bodies. People that are hell-bent on committing a murder for a specific reason disregard all the reality and facts that get in their way of committing that murder. And that's what Karina did. Karina hides Heather's body under the house and fakes a stillbirth. <laughs> she calls her boyfriend. She was crying hysterically, sounded very upset, and sounded like she was in pain. Karina's boyfriend came home. He found her laying in the bathtub, holding what he believed to be his newborn child. Uh, he realized the baby wasn't breathing. Karina's boyfriend called 911. My uh, girlfriend's just had twins. Uh, one of them's born. It, it, it's not breathing. Paramedics arrived and got her to the hospital within 10 minutes. It was very quick. <laughs> But there is a dreadful hole in Karina's story. She is supposed to be expecting twins. They put a heartbeat monitor on Karina, and they found no heartbeat of a second baby. They then conducted an examination, and the doctor told Karina that she had not given birth. And Karina argued with the doctor, saying that that's not true and that she had given birth at home. The doctor was suspicious of Karina's behavior at the hospital. She was not acting as a normal mother would. Suspicious medical staff alert the police. A frantic search begins for the real mother, starting at Karina's house. Police found bloody footprints and smears. They found a lot of blood in the bathroom, and then eventually a large pool of blood leading into the crawl space. And when they opened the crawl space, they found Heather Snively inside. It's not unusual for someone planning a murder to not pay attention to what happens after the murder. And that's usually where they get caught. The deception is over. Karina is guilty of murder, but only one count. There was nothing to indicate that, that the child had been alive or had taken a breath. As a result of this murder, there was a change in legislation which made it aggravated murder to kill a pregnant woman. And the sentence for that is life in prison with no chance of parole. In 2010, Karina Roberts is sentenced to life, never to be released. People's first thought is, well, she must be crazy. But when you're around Karina, she seems completely normal. Until you put her into the context of what she did to Heather, and then she becomes a monster. when children are not cherished. He had no childhood. Or protected. The extreme physical, mental, and nutritional neglect. Young lives are shattered. This is as bad as it gets. Mm. 
Toronto, Canada, 1998. <laughs> Being a young mom is always going to be difficult when you've got four children and you're only 24. It can push you over the edge. Shut up! Shut up, baby! You're the crackest baby ever! It's very difficult to prove that a parent is unfit and take their child or children away from them. But that's what happened. Someone needs to rescue the children. The question is, who? If a uh, next of kin are capable of looking after the child, then uh, it's best to keep the child with a family member. The children's maternal grandmother, Elva Botano, steps up. She seems to have the right qualifications, including an online course in child psychology. In fact, she is already mother to a house full of children, big and small. Some of Elva's adult children had come home and they would bring with them their boyfriend or girlfriend and sometimes friends. Husband Norman Kidman leaves the running of the house to Elva. Norman was a type of fellow that would come home after work and sit in his lazy boy chair and watch TV for the rest of the evening. Basically, he did nothing with regard to the children. A home of modest earnings, small but comfortable. They had all the amenities that any day of today would have. They had internet service, computers. Everything just appeared to be um, normal. Neighbors and friends admire Elva's dedication to her grandchildren. Hi. Oh, they're doing fine, thank you. I don't know how you do it. Love get you through. The way that Elva presented herself outside the home was a uh, very likable person. She was able to give this perception that she was a, a caring grandmother. For the next four years, the four children live with Elva. Elva treated the oldest and youngest child, 11 and four years old, very well. The very youngest, he was treated like the, like the little prince in the house. He was well-dressed, well-kept. But Elva doesn't dote over all the children. Five-year-old Jeffrey, and his six-year-old sister are shunned. Shut up in there! There was no heat coming into the room. The window was covered with paper so you couldn't see outside the window. They had no access to a bathroom. They lived in their own excrement. To say they were treated horribly would be a compliment. Only the little girl is allowed out of her dank room to go to school. But there is no escape from the dark for Jeffrey. Jeffrey never saw any daylight from the time that he was 18 months of age. And then from that point on, it was just, uh, it was just hell. In this case, with his environment being so filthy, the fact that he was trapped in a room with feces and urine, that his skin was caked with dirt, this meant that the caretaker upon which this child relies was not caring for this child in any way. The years of confinement take their toll on his little body. This child's growth would be stunted in every way possible. They develop soft bones. Their bones cannot support their muscles. Their bones will fracture easily. 
Without sunlight, the child doesn't have the psychological and neurological brain development that is necessary. It's not uncommon for an abusive parent to single out one, in this case two, children out of a group of children for abuse and neglect. And they do it right in front of the other children and sometimes other people. The rest of the household turn a blind eye to the children's plight. The people in the house had entered into some sort of unspoken agreement to not acknowledge what was happening in front of them. Instead of liberation from an abusive mom, the children are now prisoners. They put these four defenseless children right in Elba's claws. In the suburbs of Toronto in 2002. I don't know how you do it. Love gets you through. Elva Botno is admired for rearing her four grandchildren. Looks can be deceiving, but no one realizes the depth of Elva's deceit. Shut up, you stinking pigs! In her care, five-year-old Jeffrey and his six-year-old sister endure years of horror. They lived an appalling life. They were treated as subhuman even by their siblings. Everything Elva displays to the outside world is a fraud including her precious child psychology certificates. Elva, who's always taking various low-life internet courses to enhance her presentation as a good parent. And grandparenthood is proving quite lucrative, collecting the child support payments. Her sole purpose, obtaining legal custody of those children, was to subsidize them for income. She was motivated by money. Those kids were her meal ticket. So Jane Holland in Toronto for about six months, maybe a year. So are you serious about it? The home is full of adults, but no one stands up for the children, even when they're starving. They would eat while sitting on the mat. Help yourselves. They would get the scraps from the adults' plates. Fed like animals, called animals. They were continuously called pigs. <laughs> Elva told the other children in the house to refer to them as the pigs. It's also not uncommon for an abusive or neglectful parent to elicit the participation of siblings of the abused. Don't go slow. <laughs> They're forced to march around the, the room, the kitchen, in a circle around the kitchen table uh, as a form of exercise. Abusing a child gives an abusive parent an outlet for what they really feel a need to do, which is be mean and wield power and to dominate a weaker, lesser creature. Get back to your spot! It makes them feel good. Jeffrey's body can't cope with the ongoing abuse and deprivation. Finally, one adult opens his eyes and his mouth. A young man that was staying in the house commented to Elva that Jeffrey looked very bad 
This kid over here doesn't look too well. Wasn't doing well, and she should do something about it. Shouldn't you take him to the hospital or something? No, I She told him not to meddle. She's not refusing because she doesn't see that he needs it. She's refusing because she's starting to get afraid she's going to get caught. If she had gotten help or let anyone help Jeffrey, what she was doing would have been exposed, and she would have lost it. On November 30th, 2002, after four years of abuse, Jeffrey's misery ends. He crawled up the stairs slowly because he could barely walk. Went into his room, lay down, and waited. And finally stopped breathing. He died of sepsis. He weighed more when he was 18 months of age than he did at the time of his death. Finally, Elva calls 911. The paramedics arrive to find a cold body. Jeffrey's eyes were open, his lips were blue. Um, he was lifeless. Elva's not talking. But a homicide investigation reveals everything they need to know. What ended up being uncovered within the files were criminal records. And these criminal records went back to, uh, to 1970. <coughs> Elva is a serial child abuser. Herself a teen mom, Elva's first victim is her baby daughter. Why can't you just stop crying? Her first daughter died mysteriously of pneumonia when she was only five months old. Post-mortem investigation revealed bruises that were classic signs of child abuse. Elva pleaded guilty. Two more of Elva's children are also abused in 1978. this time by her husband, Norman Kidman. One of the creepiest things of the story is that the two children that Norman abused had also been kept in cages, treated like dogs, tied with dog chains, etc. I mean, this was all typical of exactly what Jeffrey had gone through. In April 2006, Elva Botano and Norman Kidman are convicted of second-degree murder and forcible confinement. Both are sentenced to life in prison. The horror of Jeffrey's life has a far-reaching effect. The Ontario Child and Family Services Act is changed to ensure background checks are done on all caregivers, something that could have saved Jeffrey. I feel haunted by Jeffrey's life because the tools to prevent those kids from going into the clutches of that couple were within the files of the agency. Little Jeffrey's death does save one life, his sisters. She was in barely better condition than Jeffrey. She had barely escaped with her life. No little child was really safe in Elvis' care, as long as one of them would be available for her to abuse. When that child was gone, she would have turned to another. A divorce doesn't always solve a couple's problems. She clearly became more and more bitter. Anger and resentment can linger. Rekha was also incredibly jealous. And sometimes the consequences are unimaginable. 
There are no words to describe how horrible this crime is. In the quiet rural village of Streatham, England, in 2007. 41-year-old <laughs> divorcee, Rekha Kumari Baker, struggles to cope with being a single mom. Rekha's divorce from her husband was pretty traumatic, and there was a lot of bitterness on the part of Rekha. Caring for her daughters, 16-year-old Davina and 13-year-old Jasmine. Now! Thank you. Seems more of a burden than a blessing. She gave the impression that she was not a mother who enjoyed being a parent. Rekha was never going to win any awards for being mother of the year, but she was okay until the divorce. Hello. Hi. On the surface, Rekha has moved on. She has a new boyfriend, a wealthy businessman. It must have seemed at the beginning like a dream relationship for Rekha because this guy had enough money that he was able to contribute towards her mortgage and the upkeep of her house. But it is still not a happy home. Eldest daughter Davina and mom are drifting apart. This reeks of alcohol and cigarettes. Be care. There were tensions. Her and uh, Davina were certainly uh, at loggerheads on occasions. Davina was a typical 16-year-old schoolgirl. Yeah, she had arguments with her mother. She was quite rebellious. But Rekha is not a mom to be toyed with. Davina's unhappiness at home with Rekha all came to a head when mother and daughter had a furious row and Rekha decided to chuck her out of the house. You can go and live with him. And she ended up moving back in with her father. She's going now. It must have been very difficult for them as sisters because they wanted to support themselves and each other. Meanwhile, dads found a new love. He and his girlfriend welcomed Davina with open arms. David's relationship with uh, Davina was clearly very close. The stable home life is just what Davina needs. The rebellious teen settles down. Davina, by all accounts, was much happier once she moved in with her father, David. Everyone is happy except Rekha. Rekha had a very complicated relationship with her two daughters. She loved them, but it turned into a love-hate relationship. She wouldn't let them go, but she really didn't want them around. Is your tart there too? Nor does Rekha want her daughter around her ex's new woman. That's ridiculous. If Davina lives here, of course they're going to spend time together. Rekha's reaction to her ex-husband's new love uh, caused even more friction with her ex-husband because he couldn't understand why Rekha felt such animosity towards this woman who'd come along long after their divorce. The facts are David had moved on in his life. He had a partner, uh, and he had a, a good relationship with his daughters. Rekha's anger is taking its toll on her relationship, too. To us? Rekha, this isn't going to work. He decided he wanted to end the relationship with Rekha. But I love you. 
be ridiculous. The relationship had run its course. It had been good, but he was moving on in life. The despair of a second lost love is more than Rekka can handle. She really found herself in the gutter emotionally. Some people fare well after a divorce, some don't. Rekka fell into the second category. Rekka started unraveling. All these things were combining to create this perfect storm, which in the end erupted in the most horrific manner. In sleepy Streatham, England. I don't want her round to Vina. Single mother, 41-year-old Rekha Kumari Baker is caught in an emotional storm, the angst of a divorce. She's going now. The challenges of raising two teenage daughters. And then her hope of happiness walks out the door when her boyfriend dumps her. Rekha was devastated by the end of her relationship and started sending obsessive texts, lots and lots of them, begging him to come back to her. She was struggling. The divorce from her husband changed the status of her life, financially, emotionally, and it set her on a path of destruction. June 12, 2007. Rekha sets in motion a meticulous plan. She picks up her eldest daughter from her exes and takes both girls shopping. Mom's in a generous mood. The girls can buy what they want. It must have surprised them enormously. This was something completely out of character. <laughs> they were both happy, they were both laughing, both, you know, they were both okay. Rekka's generosity is carefully calculated. She keeps Davina out so late, it's impractical for her to go home to dad. She spends the night with mom. And this was a very important part of that plan because she needed to guarantee that both her daughters stayed at her house that night. You look beautiful in your top today, Jazzy. Night. Love you. The girls had had a great time. They went to bed happily. Now, Rekka will get her revenge. But it won't be taken out on her exes. It will be closer to home. She goes back upstairs and she enters uh, Davina's room. And immediately started a frenzied attack. Davina had defensive wounds but she continued stabbing her daughter over and over again, and in the end, there were 39 stab wounds. Armed with these same two knives, she then entered the bedroom of her younger daughter.
and she began another frenzied attack. Jasmine, unlike her older sister, didn't even have time to fight back, and she received 29 stab wounds. There are no words to describe how horrible this crime is, that a mother who was not mentally ill would stab to death children she had raised for well over a decade. Still covered in her daughter's blood, Rekka writes a note explaining the inexplicable. Rekka says she murdered the two girls so that they would never be hurt by anyone. She seemed to be blaming the men in her life for the reason why she killed her daughters. And she talks about how she couldn't allow her daughters to be hurt as she had been hurt. Rekka turns herself in to the police, but pleads temporary insanity. At trial, she offers no evidence of mental illness. There is no evidence in anything that Rekka has ever done which would have indicated that she could have reacted so violently. There's nothing. The jury agrees. In 2007, Rekka Kumari Baker is found guilty of double murder. The jury only took 35 minutes to find Rekka guilty of the murder of both her daughters. She received a double mandatory life sentence. That means a minimum of 33 years in prison, one of the longest sentences ever given to a woman in Britain. Rekka is eligible for parole in 2040. Everyone searches for some explanation, but the only conclusion is pure hate. The judge didn't believe she was mentally ill when she killed her daughters, stabbing them each 30 times. This was a revenge murder, but she didn't kill the target of her anger. She killed what he loved. Rekka's need to hurt trumped her need to love her daughters and take care of them. It's that simple. These deadly women were cowards. They targeted the helpless. Karina Roberts stole the lives of a mother and baby to keep her man. Elva Botno tortured her grandchildren for welfare money. And Rekka Kumari Baker murdered her teenage daughters for the ultimate revenge. These deadly women had no nurturing spirit. They killed without pity.